want to help them. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Good afternoon. See, I can't tell Marion to pay attention. I have to. <laughs> All the rest of you I could call to order, but she's in charge. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Carol Mandel. I'm the um, dean of uh, libraries here at, at New York University, and I'm always uh, thrilled to welcome you here to to NYU and to our libraries, and, and I should say, based on the discussion we just had, I, I, and to our food studies collections. Our food, our incredible, now incredible, thanks to um, someone sitting right here in this corner who got us started on this, and her uh, wonderful department uh, that we're so, uh, we have a wonderful food studies collection. We have an extraordinary collection here in the Fales Library, and um, but we also take pride in that being an important component of our collecting in the library stacks as well. It's our goal is to re to support the research and writing that um, brilliant people like this panel are doing, and many of you in the audience are doing. And we're always uh, open to suggestions and ideas, not to mention collections, um, as as ways uh, of doing that. So we're very uh, very proud. Uh, of our collaboration with the Department of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health here at NYU, and, um, and to, to make this possible and make this uh, a real goal and, and program here. And we're also uh, very uh, proud and pleased of um, our collaboration with Clark uh, and the uh, American Institute for Wine and Food that uh, really helps pull together some of the the, the people that are thinking about and the issues uh, and interests that really bring this together and, and make this such a, a vital and exciting field. Um, Clark, I'm going to be introducing Clark, who's going to take over this program and, and uh, as he does it uh, so well. I really just I want to thank you for bringing these panels uh, uh, to the libraries. It's, it's great. I think Clark is probably known to many of you. He's, he's um, I was just reading uh, of the things that you've done as, you know, as food consultant and what that means. And um, actually, I have this little job for you in the food lounge downstairs. We definitely need a consultant. So uh, we'll, um, those of you who have complaints about those vending machines, Clark is going to reform us, I, I know. Um, and what he does in his um, not-for-profit support and work at, like this program here has is, is just been terrific. And so with no further ado, because we want to get to this incredible incredible panel, Clark Wolf. Thank you all. We have a lot to cover today and wonderful people to do it with. But before we do, I have a couple of announcements and I want to begin by saying that this is the first of this year's three and always when we start on the three, there becomes four. Yeah. The next one that is scheduled is June 5th and it's about water, a global discussion of a critical topic. And believe me, it's t quite important. Julia Child's nephew, Alex Perdom, is writing a book about it, and he's going to share his research in progress at that time. A woman called Maureen Clancy, who has been for 25 years at the San Diego Union Tribune, just retired, wrote a piece about bottled water that I refer to often as Alice water, you know, tap water. <laughs> and in San Diego, 80% of the people she talked to didn't know what she was talking about, and she changed the way restaurants utilize water on the table in two weeks. It's quite a process. Um, and then we hope to have Rick Moonen, uh, uh, who will be coming out with a book, who is a brilliant seafood chef and who has been selling seafood in the middle of a desert in Nevada. I think you've heard of the city, lost something. Uh, but it came to our attention that a brilliant book was uh, finally republished, a book called Beard on Food. It was four years of columns by James Beard that are as relevant and as resonant today as they were then. We were part of the group nudging for a republish, and what I want to say to you is that uh, the proceeds, the, um, what are they called, Judith? Royalties, Royalty. that's it, Royalty. they're all going, royalties, <laughs> royalties. We'll go in part to the gentleman uh, uh, who was an editor with uh, Jim Beard years and years ago, and part to the chef's fund at the Beard House for cooking so that they get more support in ordering, you know, all that stuff that they cook and, and, and then present. So that's kind of wonderful. That will be in honor of Mr. Beard's birthday. That will be May 1st here, and it will include a panel 
that has uh, um, Ruth Reichel. You may have heard of her. Uh, Laura Shapiro. You, I know you've heard of her. Uh, who else, Tosca? I forgot. Oh, oh, Mitch Davis, Mitchell Davis, who's the VP of the Beard Foundation and the author of so far four books, but you know, June's a couple months away, so we don't know what Mitch is going to do. Uh, um, so it should, oh, and Jim Dodge, who has written wonderful books, is a pastry chef and cooked and worked with James in San Francisco at the Sanford Court when he lived there half the year in the 80s. It's going to be extraordinary. If you happen to be in California on the 3rd of May, a couple of days later, at Copia, I'm doing another panel with Mary Nessel, with Michael Bauer of the San Francisco Chronicle, with Jim Dodge as well, and with a 92-year-old chipper, Chuck Williams. Quite amazing. In the process of this uh, collection of meetings and panels, uh, we have wanted very much to support the food studies program in the department. And I uh, have a quick uh, update today uh, about a piece of the food studies program that has been um, worked on and we couldn't feel more proud of because it has to do with the whole system of how food moves and goes through our society. Um, Judith Gilbride is here, the chairman of the department. Hi, Judy. Good to see you here. The last time I saw Judy, oh, I'll, I'll have Kay Ray come up in a second, but this is Judy Gilbride. Everybody applaud. It's good for your cardio. Come on, she's wonderful. And I have to say, this is a department chair who, who, who lives, walks the walk. The last time I saw her was in Maine in a farmer's market, and there were like five people, and it was Judy and us. So we know she's the real deal. All food studies faculty stand up if you're here. There we go. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Right. OK. Thank you. Now, uh, Krishnendu Ray, who we call affectionately K. Ray, uh, is going to tell us a little bit about the food systems program that it's about to launch. K. Ray. OK. Uh, quickly. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Clark. Um, it's been about a year now uh, that uh, we have introduced uh, a concentration called food systems. And that came about, and I want to just make a couple of announcements related to that. Um, uh, we realized that we have been doing food studies for about 10 years, and which was uh, Marion Clark uh, kind of uh, invention uh, uh, about a decade ago. And uh, in taking stock, we realized that um, what we do mostly in terms of food studies is culture and consumption. And what had been missing is, uh, uh, and I think Alice Waters had criticized us uh, when uh, this program was put in place, that we don't talk enough about agriculture and uh, that uh, we don't talk enough about processing. Uh, so uh, Alice should be happy. We are bringing those things into the curriculum now. And we have a couple of, uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we also li listen to our students. And, uh, uh, and that was one of the critique of it. So we have uh, a couple of courses, and one of them links to uh, the topic uh, for the next one, it's called, for instance, we're introducing classes now called uh, Food Markets, Concepts and Cases that Fabio is teaching, and uh, a class called uh, Water Waste uh, and the uh, Urban Environment. Mm, and, uh, and specifically, just to give you a quick sense, our specificity in this would be different from the land-grant universities with their big and very successful ag programs. Uh, our focus is on um, uh, the food system in terms of the city. Uh, uh, urban food systems and its relationship to it. So that's all I wanted to announce. And uh, uh, this is about, we are about a year into it and uh, should get quite robust over the next year. Thank you. Wonderful. That's wonderful news, Joy. Well, and uh, I have the great pleasure to announce an acquisition uh, that will support that effort. Uh, Gus Schumacher was Under Secretary of Agriculture under Bill somebody. Um, Bill Clinton, and uh, is a wonderful friend of many of ours and of this kind of work. And uh, he has given me, and I'm pleased to present to Marvin and to Carol, here are some preliminary pictures from the family farm history in Manhattan, 72nd and Broadway, 1855 to 1888, and then in Flushing from 1890s to 1938. My grandfather and his sons then moved to Hyde Park and farmed from 39 to 68. I have some movies from Flushing Farming in 22 and also from 1960 when I was caught moving irrigation pipe in New Hyde Park on a summer parsley field. As I get some additional time, I'll try and put together a booklet from the family pictures, articles, and movies from the era, including ex excerpts from my grandfather's diary. He had a daily farm diary. Today, the cow, you know, coughed. 
from 1890 to 1955, daily on farming and marketing in New York City, Gus Schumacher. So it's my pleasure to, uh, and you can all see them afterwards. So th this is a photograph from 1888 of the Schumacher farm selling at the New York City Farmer's Market, 1888. So this is part of the archive. Marvin, Carol, here is the beginning of extraordinary collection and uh, wonderful papers that we hope you'll all ask your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents to also bring. And now let me introduce Marvin Taylor, the curator of this collection. Thank you. And, and thanks to Gus for this amazing collection. Um, as best I understand it, his family fled Germany in 1848 after the revolution and ended, ended up in New York. And that being farmers, they started to farm at 78th or 72nd and Broadway, um, which is just astonishing to think of farming and farming lasting into the 30s, still within the city limits of New York City. Um, uh, I wanted to announce, in addition to this uh, acquisition, we made another acquisition recently uh, that's related to food ways, because when the department started to go down this path, I thought, oh my god, how am I going to support this? And an amazing collection uh, was mentioned to me. It's the Dennis Kimball and Pope Fruit Farm documents, records. It's about four linear feet. Um, they ran uh, in the city, I have to have my, my cheat sheet here. Um, from circa 1915 to 1923, they were one of the first companies to be importing grapes from California and some of the very first um, refrigerated cars and its extensive correspondence with the growers in California and then with the markets and the places they were selling it to here in the city. And so that's another of these collections as we continue to, to focus on New York's history and how things got into this metropolis, which um, leads me just one anecdote that Gus talk, told me. Did any of you know about the farm trains? Yeah. Gus told me this story. There were trains that would come in from Long Island, New Jersey to the shore and then there were ferries. And these trains, one train would have the carts and horses, and the next car on the train would have the produce, et cetera. And they'd come up to Hoboken, or uh, to, or to um, the end of Queens, and get on ferries, and then come across, disperse, um, go to the various markets throughout the city, sell their wares, and collect manure from the horses to take back out the opposite way in the evening to use as fertilizer. And I always wondered, what did they do with all the horse shit in New York City? And then finally, after you know, 25 years of wondering, Gus Schumacher told me the answer. So uh, with that, uh, thank, uh, thanks to Gus. Thanks to you all for coming. And uh, Clark? Or, These are the mysteries that will be solved when you do research in our collection. <laughs> Thank you, Marvin. All right, and, and, and thank you, Carol, for being here. I want to mention that thanks to Paula Jennings and the Development Department, there is now a group called the Friends of Fales Library and the Collection. And so there can actually be a membership, and you get a wonderful, to begin with, a collection of note cards that are from some of the gorgeous, some of them antique, some of them a little bit more modern books that are in the collection, hand selected by Marion Nessel and produced by the department. But I have to let these people start talking. Today's gathering uh, really stems from a conversation with somebody who in our world is incredibly legendary and completely down to earth at the same time. Um, this is a person who got in the kitchen and did the stuff and isn't afraid of it and is uh, uh, as rigorous a uh, cook as she is uh, an editor. And so what I want to do is begin by introducing and welcoming the author of the newly published The Tenth Muse, My Life in Food. Please welcome Judith Jones. You know, you know, it's interesting. Many people want to honor Judith. She'd rather get to work. And so I'm delighted that she's here today. The book, by the way, is in back. It is for sale afterwards. And yes, that is a cigarette in her hand on the spine. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> I always catch her on that. Uh, next to Judith is a gentleman who's going to talk to us uh, about some of this process as well. And he is the editor of the Dining In and Out. I get so confused the dining pintimento section, right, of the New York Times. Please welcome Pete Wells. And then one of our beloved professors whose name I finally learned how to pronounce correctly, so he's going to be on a lot of panels. Uh, he's, a, he's a food historian. He's a, a, a sociologist. He it, it writes for Gambioroso, and he is Fabio Persecoli. Please welcome. Hi, yeah? And I can say three Italian cheeses, too. Uh, and then uh, to my immediate left is a gentleman who I've uh, uh, enjoyed getting to know. Uh, this is the next generation. And uh, Francis Lamb, 
uh, came to my attention because he wrote a piece that was so wonderful about his experience in the kitchen for Gourmet Magazine that unbeknownst to him, it ended up in the best food writing of 2006. And it's one of those things where, I, you know, across the country, we were, we were actually both in bookstores kind of at the same time. And we went, oh, look at that. And that's how it was told to him. Apparently, these ceremonies are really quite formal. Um, but since that time, Francis writes for the Financial Times about restaurants. He writes for Gourmet Magazine. If you happen to see this month's Ode to an Omelette, I mean, we were just kind of goofy about it. Francis also has a day job in, where he uh, assists uh, as a consultant in the development of um, uh, not-for-profits in Asian communities around the country. He's just come up from Mississippi. I don't even know how that equation works. Please welcome <laughs> Francis Lam. Uh, now, I don't know if we have the cards. We will pass out cards. Uh, it, it's going to be a little bit more back and forth today because these are all opinionated folk, um, and that's good. So what I want to do is I want to begin uh, down there, and I want you to each tell me to begin with. Let's start with give us a few, two, three, four characteristics or tasks, qualities, focus that you expect from a good editor, whether it be you as the editor or somebody who's editing you. Shall we start with Judith? Well, I speak here primarily as an editor because my new life as a writer is very new. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as an editor, what I look for in somebody writing a book about food, and it's usually a cookbook, I look for that voice. And if it isn't immediately apparent, I at least want to feel that I can pull that voice out. because. I, I think we, we sort of killed the voice in food and all of our cookbooks and wrote formula writing. And recipe writing, sharing and teaching a recipe to somebody is not a formula process. It's not scientific. What you want is somebody who has his or her own way of doing something and inspires you and empowers you in the home kitchen all alone when you're suddenly trying this thing and kind of flying blind. So that's extremely important to me. And I, I think so often, you know, when Aim Chef will say, sure, I'll do a cookbook, and he hires a writer. The writer never even sees him cook. Uh, there's no attempt at substitute ingredients when instead of buying six different fresh herbs and truffle oil and goodness knows what. and. Uh, so that, that, that's extremely important to me, that, that that person write his own book, or if not, at least have the collaborator there watching, asking questions, uh, catching a voice. Uh, I think those are the essential things, uh, that, that sense of remembering the home cook and empowering uh, cookbooks of all how-to books they don't have different levels. That you don't have a cookbook for a beginner and a, 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 a chef and a fairly advanced, experienced cook. You, they're all treated the same. And so you have to find strategies to give that information to what Julia used to call the nervous Nellies. <laughs> and all the, the information, they, and yet not burden the recipe with so much detail that the more professional cook doesn't want to bother. So you have to think of things like sidebars, and it's, it's a very challenging and creative process. And as an editor myself, I work very, very closely with anybody doing a cookbook. Pete, you have had the experience of being an editor in a magazine where, let's face it, in our experience, the editor is the star of that show. I mean, that, you know, you're the one with the picture at the front. Uh, not me. Not you, okay. <laughs> and now you're uh, editing uh, uh, a lot of forceful bylines. Is that a polite way of putting it? A lot of forceful bylines. People with their own reputations and at a, a, a powerful institution where it's perhaps a different process. As you're talking about your kind of short list of what an editor needs to be able to do, will you contrast a little bit for us if there is a contrast between the newspaper life and the magazine life for once a month? And don't look at me like that, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so that's what you do as an editor. You look at your editor. Well, just one question. You made it into two. Go, well, all right. <laughs> See, he's the editor. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, the, well, hmm. uh, uh, the, the process at a magazine is a lot more leisurely, and, uh, or ca can be. I mean, uh, 
uh, you have a little more time to work on things like structure and drawing out the writer's voice and you know a, a sort of a long peculiar lead that will draw the reader in just through sheer confusion and mystery which which and those are the kind of the last things you want in a in a newspaper piece you, yeah. readers we assume wants with well, the reader we assume wants to know what the story's about pretty quickly uh, so we try not to construct long, elaborate leads that uh, uh, um, uh, leave you in the dark until about you know the, the two thousandth word. Um, you know that that can work really beautifully in a magazine story. Right. Um, um, <coughs> of course, you know at a newspaper you, <coughs> we report on the news, so you want to oh. talk about what's happening right now, today, yesterday, tomorrow. Um, uh, Magazines, especially monthly magazines where I worked, you, you want to be timely, but it's a very, very different kind of timeliness where you're talking about, you know, what's in the culture at this moment, but not necessarily today. Uh, um, so. Elaborate on that a little bit. The time frame. I mean, we understand that in the newspaper it could be what's important this week, and the timeliness in a, in a magazine. What's the cultural arc? Well, you know, you're, uh, in a monthly magazine, you're often uh, Closing two, three, sometimes more weeks before the thing will actually appear, and then if it's a monthly magazine, it's going to stay in the newsstands for a month, um, and sometimes readers won't get around to it right away either. So, uh, um, uh, if you if you are breaking news, you're you're pretty lucky. But then, but you know, by the time the readers gotten to it, it's probably already entered the ozone, and they've picked up on it someplace. Yeah. Uh, and other but at the same time, you know, you don't want it to feel like something that could have been written ten years ago. It right. should feel of the moment, but it can't really be a, of that precise moment. Well, we're going to get back to something that you just raised um, in a little bit, but thank you, uh, Fabio. Give us a couple of your characteristics about your experience um, in good editing. As an editor, uh, for me, it's very important, especially in Italy. I deal also with you know personalities. TV personalities and whatnot, oh. and as the word says, they have personalities, uh, meaning that whatever they say, that's it. And as an editor, sometimes it's a work of patience and mediation to work with these people and just try to get the best out of them, um, and also push them to be a little more precise. I was working mm. with this very famous journalist who wrote a very nice book on herbs. And I was doing the editing, and he was going, you know, herbs all over the world. And for him, you know, the Tang and the Qing in China is the same thing. And it was, and when I was, you know, just pointing out a few elements in history, he got mad. Mm. Because, like, that's irrelevant. That was his answer. So, and uh, sometimes, in my experience, when you work with big TV personalities and whatnot, it takes a lot of patience and, you know, just go in your Zen zone and uh, <laughs> talk to them and try to, to work with them. So it, it's fun in a way. Um, some, I work also to, um, to teach new writers to, to come out. Uh, in, in Gambero Rosso, we have this school for journalism and communication in food and wine. So every year I have a new batch of students that want to do that. So it's very interesting to, as an editor, to try to teach them, you know, what, how to construct a piece and exactly the arc and what to do with it. And then with the nicest uh, pieces, we, we try to do something. This year we put them on our website so everybody could read them, you know, all over the country. They were very happy with it. When I'm an editee, uh, <laughs> I like also my editor to be patient with me, especially with my English, because sometimes I write, you know, uh, English is not my first language. So these days I'm working with a fantastic editor in Oxford that despite his all, you know, Britishness, is very gentle, very nice, and he really works also with me on the content. I'm writing on pop culture and He's bouncing ideas with me while we work, so that's that's a fantastic experience. Great, Francis. How about for you? And I know, you, again, you deal with 
more than one editor on a regular basis, and in each context you deal with a few editors. By the way, these are very sensitive mics. And it just occurred to me, these are all people who tend to present themselves to us behind their words or behind the words of other people. So I have to say, it's a real privilege, and we appreciate your coming out from behind the pen to be here. Anyway, um, Francis. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, well, first, you know, they say uh, when you speak in front of a crowd and you're a little nervous, what you do is imagine everyone in their underwear. Um, <laughs> and it's easier to do that when you're at home behind a computer. But <laughs> maybe I shouldn't talk about that. Um, <laughs> um, so an editor. <laughs> I think you, you do want to talk about that. standing <laughs> 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 Okay, so um, so I so I've been thinking about this question, right? Largely because I have to come here and talk about it and try to sound um, like I have something to say. Uh, and so when I thought about the idea of, so I, I I went back to think about some of the the best work that I feel that I've done with an editor, and what that work has been like, and what that process was like, and what that has always felt to me. And this word has come up twice already. What that's always felt to me, um, most similar to is, is 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 teaching, right? In the way that when I think of great teaching, I think of someone who asks questions, mm -hmm. asks great questions, rather than someone who gives answers. Right? Like that's that's what I think about when I think of great teaching. Um, and I think of um, my sort of um, uh, best work with editors being a communication and being a back and forth between myself and this person who can look at the piece and ask the questions of the piece needed to be asked, ask the questions of the ideas ask the questions of the language, really ask, what are you trying to say? How are you saying that right now? Um, and push me and challenge me. Another thing I think of when I think of great teaching, right? A teacher pushes and challenges the student um, just outside their comfort level. Hmm. So where it's productive, you know, sort of a productive discomfort, right? Um, and so I, I find that, like, when I were a file a piece, I sort of dread a little bit the email from the editor. I sort of <laughs> dread a little bit the call. Because it's going to be uncomfortable. They're going to ask the questions. I'm going to be like, oh, I was kind of hoping you didn't notice that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what you need, right? That you need someone to do that pushing. Um, but also another thing um, that I think is really important is, is, is do that in a way where you really allow the writer, and maybe this is just me and my ego talking, but really allow me to try to find a way to, to fix the things that need to be fixed, right? Mm -hmm. To really do it in, in, in the voice that I'm trying to present, do it, do put the idea that I was trying to maybe not really getting to, but like make me refine that so that it's helpful for me. Judith, I mean, you've had some of the most extraordinary and legendary experiences with writers and that whole process. Mm -hmm. I mean, will you tell us a little bit about, I don't know, working with uh, Julia, working with Edna, working with Marion Cunningham? Well, I can say that each one is different, but uh, in over 50 years of being a general editor, Working on a cookbook takes the most time, the most patience, the most involvement. And that's probably me. I mean, I throw myself into it. I, for instance, I once, uh, early on, I think it was for Mastering the Art Volume 2, I said to Julia casually, well, I said two things. One, don't you think it would be nice to have a French bread? Because in those days, you couldn't get a decent baguette, even in New York. And uh, I said, a French meal isn't really a French meal without a baguette to mop up the sauce. And she said, you're right. <laughs> so she, but she was busy f finishing a lot of elaborate recipes. So she said, you know, I think Paul, her husband, could do the research. He used to make bread when he was in college. So poor Paul <laughs> started making French bread, and starting knowing nothing. And he actually sent them to me in New York. They were living in Cambridge. And I'd open this parcel post package <laughs> and find this. It looked like the limb of a gnarled old olive tree. <laughs> 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 and make a long story short, Julia finally said, we'll take the flour and the yeast and even the salt, and we'll take them to the best uh, bread teacher in France, and we'll find out what's wrong. So she did. But another time I just said casually, this was to make a cassoulet, and you couldn't find just a little French garlicky sausage essential for a cassoulet. And I said, do you think you could just make it and use a patty? Sure. 
And I, the next time I was up in Cambridge, her kitchen wall was covered in statistics. She had gone back to old charcuterie books of the 18th century, I think, <laughs> and tried these recipes in her notes, and gradually she got up to her own formula. And I said, Julia, how marvelous. And she said, well, it's easy. It's just as easy as making a hamburger. Mm. <laughs> but she had done the work. Well, now, she was somebody you could, uh, that was just who she was and why she was such a great teacher. Other people are more skittish, but... Uh, oh, go ahead. Go, go, you can tell us one of those stories, too, if you like. <laughs> I once said to Lydia Bastianich, for instance, she was, had made a beautiful lasagna and, and the, all the dough was used up except for one long stocking shape. And I said, I knew what I was doing. I said, Lydia, are you going to throw that out? Good heavens, no, said she. And she picked up the stocking, looked at it. And then she got a little baking dish. And she went like this with the stocking. And she plopped a little meat sauce. She plopped a little cheese. She plopped a few vegetables. And just built this nice little pyramid in this little dish. And she said, my lunch tomorrow. Perfect. Well, of course, we put it in the book. Because that is what is, to me, missing in so many cookbooks, that we don't treat cooking as a rhythm through the week, how you use something if it's not used up, how you plan for the next day. And she just fell into this. She loved doing it. So. Well, you talked about, uh, you said a couple of times, a casual comment, mm -hmm. a casual comment from Judith Jones. Right, not a casual comment, and to Julia Child. These are serious people with serious comments. Pete, you have a deadline, and at the other end of it is not going to be maybe three months or six months or 12 months of people communicating to France. It's going to be a story in the New York Times, and it, you're going to have to stand behind that story. So in the process, will you tell us a little bit about, for example, I was very impressed and very interested by the piece that Marion Burroughs did on, on the Mercury and Tuna, right? Yeah. Extraordinary. And the firestorm of letters and public editor and emails and blogs and, you know, gnarled oak tuna arms being sent in the mail to people. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the, 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 the process there where the, the role of the editor is less to gently suggest to a brilliant mind what they might explore and more about, you know, vetting a killer headline to make sure and, and what that process is all about, that, you know being the editor in that process? Uh, it, it was really simple. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're lying. Go ahead. Not much to tell. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. Well, I mean, uh, Marion Burr has worked on that story for a long time, six months or more. Um, and I'm not sure I even knew what it was about until after we published it. Well. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and we're, you know, defending it. And, and I think that's when it started to, to come together for me, which is probably not ideal. Probably I should have <laughs> understood the story maybe just before we published yeah, it. That would be good. It doesn't always work that way. You know, I mean, um, it, uh, um, sometimes you don't know what you're doing until you've done it. Um, uh, um, that what, boy, what what was involved in that? Um, uh, there, we we all we knew really from the beginning was that we were going that we were going to to test some tuna for mercury because yeah. Marion thought that um, uh, people were eating a lot of uh, fresh tuna in the in the form of sushi and didn't know. What what she knew, which was that it was high in mercury, so we we, we knew something that the that we thought the readers probably didn't know, and from that simple idea of uh, a ton of research and that and many many drafts and and uh, uh, and just about uh, you know, everybody in the uh, all the editors in the dining section uh, worked on it and vetted it extensively, and then when when uh, when we found out that they were the paper was interested in putting it on the front page, then a whole new raft of editors got involved, uh, um, and uh, just kind of what what uh, Francis was just saying. Every every new person who looked at it asked a new question, and yeah. and uh, uh, you're trying to, to I guess to anticipate the questions that the reader is going to ask, and you and you hope that the that 
by the time you get it into print, you'll, you'll have answered all of the reader's questions. And you, you hope that the reader doesn't get to the end of it and say, what was that about? You know, yeah. so, um, that, that, but the, with a complicated story like that, it, uh, I, I'm not a, a huge believer in editing by committee, but with, a, with, with that kind of story, I think it really helped. But then you, you kind of refer to the fact that the, your job as an editor didn't end with the publication of the story. Uh, no, not in that case, no. Um, so tell us a little bit about that, because I think it's fascinating for people. I, well, uh, um, He's reliving it. It's painful. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, we, we were challenged extensively on that by, in particular, by, 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 by a few people, but in particular by a group that represents the fishing industry. And their first comment was how come we're not in the story and the, uh, and then uh, but then after that they chat they chat they challenged every comma and semicolon in it and uh, and really kept me busy for for a couple of weeks where I was not, not doing much else except answering their their uh, answering their letters to me demand where they were demand they start their their opening bargain was we want you to retract the whole story <laughs> Um, and and then I, I I just had to keep coming back to them saying you know this thing that you say is wrong is right this thing you say is wrong we never said and it just went on from there but uh, and then then uh, um, uh, it was written about uh, all over the place and I, I didn't really deal with that I mean a few a few other you know uh, newspapers and some online publications who challenged the piece. I, I didn't get into answering that, but then when the public editor of the New York Times got involved, I did have to deal with that, and that's a, a peculiar institution within the Times where there's a, uh, somebody who is supposed to be the representative of the readers who, who is a, um, both a journalist and uh, uh, um, uh, a, uh, let me, let me, uh, how should I put it? Curmudgeon. Yeah, Curmudgeon. He's, <laughs> he's, uh, 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 he's a sort of unique role where he, he both reports on what happens within the Times and weighs in on what he thinks about it all. How, how many of you have ever read the public editor column? I call it the, the other Clark. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and so what you're talking about is you had a public conversation, really a very public on-the-record conversation with a lot of people all at once over this article that you understood moments after it was published. No, th this was part of the learning to understand the article. There you go. I, I, it, was, it was all together. Well, which brings me to the issue, and I, again, I don't want to speak for anyone, but to me, I, I, we all know that, that we trust certain voices with certain stories. I mean, for myself, if Marion Burroughs is at the top of it, I'm going to be pretty sure that it's going to be tooth and nail to the letter. It's going to be right. It's going to be correct. Talk a little bit about, Fabio and, and, and Francis, about matching, the uh, well, the combination of... of acquisition and composition. The idea, is it the right writer for that story, or is it the editing of any story by, to turn that story into something that's appropriate? T talk a little bit about uh, putting the personalities and the talents together. Uh, let's start with Fabio and, and, and obviously Francis, and then Judith, of course, we have to get back to you about that one. Well, um, as a normal policy at Gambero Rosso, we try to give the, the, the dangerous stories to yeah. people on staff. People that have worked on stuff for 10, 15 years, because um, we, we end up in those situations quite often. Like recently, uh, recently last year, there was a piece on Prosciutto di Parma, and one of our oldest editors dared to say that not all Prosciutto di Parma is good because it's got a stamp on it of Prosciutto di Parma, and uh, which is absolutely true. But it created a big havoc in the industry. Um, of course, all the advertising and you know disappeared and all that. That's that's pretty normal. So we know how that happens. So we are very careful to who we give stories, uh, especially if they're big ones. And there's also a different impact depending on where they are. Uh, on the website, we go on the daily day by day thing. So we try to break news. But then, you know, there's more space for discussion. People can answer back and whatnot. Then we have the TV channel, and there we put stuff, you know, on a weekly basis. We have the magazine, which is a monthly, and uh, the stories are closed three, four weeks before it goes, yeah. it goes out. And then we have the books. So 
for the books, we try to give voice to interesting people. Very often, it's celebrities of personalities that get in touch with us, uh, asking if we're interested in publishing, publishing things. Uh, other times, we ask people to, to write. But when it comes you know, to that sort of dangerous news, or another time we had a problem with Ferrarelle. I don't know if you're familiar with the water. I don't know if it's sold here in the States. It is. But we, we had an analysis of the water, and basically the public water in Rome turned out to be better mm -hmm. than Ferrarelle. Now, that was a big stink. Yeah. And it's, it went to court all the way. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but, of course, we had the analysis, so they couldn't say much. But that's the kind of story you want a very uh, vetted editor, a very expert editor to manage. Uh, very often it goes to the publisher, uh, and he manages them himself. Wow. Yeah. Francis, uh, again, maybe from a different perspective, do you get assignments or suggestions of assignments that don't feel right for your voice, or do you seek a certain kind of story, or do you just sit with an editor and say, okay, these are the five things I'm thinking about and that I would like to noodle about in a story for you? Sure. Um, it's some combination of those, right? Um, to be frank, uh, <clears throat> as a writer, you're kind of always starving for work. So you want to say yes to everything. Um, but, you know, and I've said yes to things that I'm like, I don't really know. Like, I, I don't really know that I care about this subject. I don't really know that I want to care about this subject. But I kind of can't refuse it. And not that I compromise myself, but I thought, okay, well, sort of convince me, right? Like, let's have a conversation. Again, it comes back to this idea of conversation with your editor. Let's have a conversation. Why are you interested in this? Like, that's the question I want to ask the editor. And does that jibe with something that is a question I want to explore? And in one case, actually, <clears throat> um, I ended up going uh, to a part of the country that I didn't think I was particularly excited about. And um, because I had this, I had this assignment, um, uh, the other had convinced me that there was a reason to be excited about it. And so I went with a sort of skepticism. And I think that actually ended up being um, so the backbone of my story, the idea that I wasn't there because I was already enchanted with it, I wasn't there because I was already psyched about it, but I was there because I was curious about it. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, for me personally, the thing that I want to be able to um, present in a lot of my stories is that sense of discovery and that sense of wonder. Um, I'm really invested in that as a person. Like That's something I really look for in the world, and so I really want to be able to a, experience things where I'm constantly like, oh my God, I didn't know. Holy, holy sh... You know? Like, yeah. um, and that's something I want to translate on the page. Um, so in that sense, I think um, it's, it's important to have interests that you really know you want to discover and also have things that you are willing to explore and willing to say, you know, I'm not... I'm not only going to do things that are shiny toys. Right. So what part of the country was it? Uh, it's where you live, Clark. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you were going there. <laughs> uh, Francis wrote a rather wonderful piece ab about Western Sonoma County in the October issue of Gourmet. And it was s stunning and shocking and wonderful because it was so vividly true. Uh, for all of us who spend some time out there, uh, part of the lead was that he, he talked about strawberries that have flavor that candy aspires to. You know, and as he was driving through it, he said something about it. he wants to write about the air, he wants to write about the land, he wants to write poetry. He's like, okay, fine, hey, it's your assignment. And, and there were a lot of people who, who looked at the piece and said, well, gosh, Red's recovery room, the guy in the back with the tattoo, it was such a pleasing real experience because that's what the writing was about. And Judith, you have had real experiences with extraordinary writers. Is it your moving, sidling over to their voice or having their voice kind of moved over or distracted with a casual comment to the bread? I mean, what is that process of matching the voice with the writing? I don't think it's, it's so much matching as, as pulling it out of somebody. Okay. But I, I have been interested in odd books. We did just a delightful book by uh, Andrew Todd Hunter called A, Me called a Meal Observed. Yeah. And that just came to me. It wasn't quite finished, but the idea was simply to observe the whole process of a beautiful French meal in Paris at a very, at Taiwan, very high class restaurant, 
And as Americans, we're sort of nervous when we go into a place like that. We aren't sure we're going to behave properly or do the right thing. And so he told it from that point of view, going in with his wife and feeling sort of self-conscious. And then all of a sudden, halfway through, well, a third of the way through, you found out that he had been working in the kitchens. But so he had the behind the scene view. I, I, I feel there should be more books that just are about the food experience. Uh, when I decided to do this little book, I distinctly wanted it, my life in food, because that, as I thought about it, it was really what shaped me, what released me from my family in a way, who were very, my mother was very English and conservative, and we never had garlic in the house or yeah. onions and all those smelly things were always closing, opening the windows and closing the doors so the house wouldn't smell. And it was, it was just a great release to go to Paris and wallow in, in the, the sheer pleasure of food. And it's, it's as Brias Savarin says, it's uh, the pleasure that lasts the longest. All the others <laughs> fade, but you can have it right up into old age. And I, I just wanted to get that message across, sort of telling my own story as as not an example, but just, you know, this is how I did it, and it was fun. You'll have fun, too. You, you talk about that. And by the way, I'm not going to make any of the obvious current political jokes that could have been made there. I really, I, I was very good about that. <laughs> you, you suggested this whole experience of food, and I want to ask you all, um, Judith particularly, and Pete, um, you discovered and brought to publication the Anne Frank Diaries. Mm -hmm. You're somebody who sees something that maybe other people have seen as well, and you say, you know, like pornography, you know it when you see it. You say, oh my goodness, that's something. Pete, you do that too. That's your job. That's what they pay you for to say, that's a story. You that's not a story. The instinct. But, yeah. but tell us a little bit about that if, if it wouldn't totally destroy the alchemy at this point in your career. Well, uh, in the story of Anne Frank, I just, I was working for the Doubleday editor in Paris, and he'd gone off to have lunch with some French publishers and told me to get rid of these manuscripts. He looked at them, and so I was writing the rejection letters. It was a big <laughs> pile. And I got towards the bottom, and I found this advanced copy of a French book, and it was the diary of Anne Frank. And I looked at that face on the cover, and it, it just drew me in. And I sat and read all afternoon, and when my boss finally came home, uh, he said, what are you doing still here? And I said, we've got to call. You didn't make tele transatlantic telephone calls in those days. I think I said we have to send a telegram <gasps> and tell Doubleday that I've got to publish this book because it's just one of a kind. He said, what? The book by that kid? And I found out later that at least a half a dozen publishers had turned it down. And why? I think because there wasn't a precedent for it. Uh, and I think you just have to follow your, your own instinct about these things. And certainly when I, I encountered this tome on French cooking, yeah. I just thought this book had been written for me because I had spent that time in France, come back to America, and it seemed like a wasteland. There were no cookbooks that really instructed you, uh, told you what substitute materials you could use because we didn't have all shallots, leeks, mushrooms. You never saw them in a, in a supermarket. So you really needed somebody to take you by the hand and teach you the techniques and empower you. And that's what this book did. I, I think it really, in a way, changed forever the way we think about food and the way cookbooks are written, particularly when we got this big Smith college girl on yeah. the television who <laughs> called herself the French chef. Mm -hmm. And it's as though we had been suppressed all these years and our appetites were <laughs> finally released. And I think we've been having fun with food ever since, although we still have a kind of uh, love-hate relationship, if you know what I mean. I think, yeah, we do. Pete, uh, again, for you, the process of identifying, I mean, as a magazine editor, many ideas come to you and they're proposed to you. But some of them come at editorial meetings. But at, at a newspaper with the position yours holds, uh, 
how does that work? Are there things that you generate in meetings and conversations? Are there things that are brought to you? How do you look at a, at a topic and say, that's us, we got to do that, and, and you're the writer to do it? Um, well, one of the things that you try to do is learn to, to pay attention to your reactions, even the, the, the tiny ones, yeah. and sometimes things that you are ashamed of or want to suppress. Like if some, I, I, often I will find that I, I can't finish a, a, like a pitch that's come to me. Somebody will re, send me an email. I want to, you know, here's a great story for the New York Times. And I've, after the second sentence, I I can't um, go on. It's <laughs> <laughs> a pretty good one. But I, but I, I'm very slow to blame the writer because I think, you know, or, uh, um, that. You know, it's my fault because I'm just distracted. There's a lot going on around me. Um, uh, so I, I've learned to, to, to pay a little bit more attention to, to like, what, you know, if I'm on to something else before I've even finished this, it, maybe it's not going to go anywhere. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, conversely, sometimes an idea will seem interesting <laughs> But then, you know, I'll ask the writer, well, it's okay, so what else would be in the story? And, and there isn't anything else. You know, there's, a, you know, there's this great restaurant opening. Oh, tell me more. Well, it's a great restaurant. It's going to be great. The chef is really famous, and, and uh, we should write about it. Well, tell me more. Well, the, the restaurant is opened by the chef, and he's really famous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so if it, you know if if um, if I can't <laughs> if I can't start to get a, a picture of what this story might be and how it could possibly be interesting, then yeah. I, I, I try to say no, even though you know, on some intellectual level, you might be able to persuade me like this chef is so famous, we need to write about his restaurant. But but um, if if you can't convince me to to keep my eyes open long enough to to, to hear why you think it's a good story, then maybe it's not a good story. So. Um, you know, and and that that same sort of you know, uh, you know, listening to your reactions is for me is 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 one of the ways that I edit as I'm going through the story line by line, word by word. You know, like um, uh, some often, all the time, I'll be confused by something, and and I have to convince myself that I'm not confused because I'm stupid or because I was looking out the window and I'm confused because it's confusing and mm. so uh, <laughs> um, then, then I have to go back to the writer but I uh, um, uh, it, it hasn't come naturally to me that I've had to sort of teach myself that that the reactions that that I'm having probably come from something that is not just about my own like the you know intoxicated craziness. Right. You know? Well, all right, speaking of intoxicated no, craziness, no, of craziness, um, <laughs> and, and we'll continue on, and Pete, you can comment on this, and by the way, uh, as long as you promise not to fill all of these pieces of paper with pitches for stories for Pete, if you have questions that you'd like to r write down on those pieces of paper that Tosca gave you and send them up, we do have a little bit of time, and I'll vet through them, and I'll make sure that the dirty words are crossed out, so send them up if you have them, but in the meantime, um, uh, uh, how much is, because you talked about a very sensitive response, is the sensitive response to you as the editor or to the reader, or are, are you responding on behalf of the reader, whether you're the editor or the writer? Pete, you want to? Well, you hope, that, you hope that you are responding on, on behalf mm -hmm. of the reader. You hope that you're asking the questions the reader will ask, um, to, uh, take, making the objections the reader will make, the, re the, the reader will say, wait a minute, yeah. you know, wait, that, that didn't happen that way. Those things aren't really the same. Um, and uh, again, sometimes like, you have to force yourself to do it because you, you know, we, we have, I like the writers I work with, yeah. and I don't want to say, you know, this third paragraph <laughs> doesn't make any sense, uh, you know. Um, but you've, <laughs> you've got to do it, because if you don't do it, the reader's going to do it. Well, we'll get to back to that, because I want to go back to something that you've just brought up and that Judith mentioned about corrections. And, and actually, you said the same thing, uh, Fabio, making a correct. Well, go ahead and comment on that, and then we'll get I, to the I other. I wanted to comment something about cookbooks. Uh, what Judith was saying was relevant for us, too, in Italy, because uh, in Italy, for, for 30 years, there was a big void of uh, transmission of cooking, meaning that uh, 
we're supposed, you know, to learn how to cook from our moms. As a matter of fact, our moms don't know how to cook any longer. Yeah. Uh, so if you're lucky, it's your grandmother. If you're lucky, it's your mother. But there is a whole bunch of people in Italy that don't know how to cook any longer. So as a publisher in food, we had to find a way to get people to rediscover their traditions in a very easy, in a very practical way that people could do in their daily life. The problem is that in the 60s, half of the South moved north. Uh -huh. uh, they didn't want to be connected with their rural origins any longer, with their traditions and dishes. People in the north would make fun of them at certain points. Um, they wanted to be modern, to work in the industry, who's got time to work in the kitchen, and women started working, you know, the, the whole story. In Italy started in the 60s. Well, wait a second. We just didn't know it was happening in Italy. We are so relieved to know that they went through it too, aren't we? Oh, yeah. I know okay. I am. Well, this happened around the 60s yeah. uh, when uh, finally after the war, the industrialization took off. So in the South, there was no jobs. In the North, there were lots of jobs. And so there was a mass migration in, into the North. But anyway, the situation is that uh, there was this chain of transmission and the chain of transmissions was broken. So when Gambero Rosso started again, we were lucky enough to have this woman working with us that was able to take very traditional, very daily recipes and make them relevant and modern and possible for people who were not able to cook any longer. And when we, I was thinking, you know, you have to think what your reader thinks. For us is, okay, we have to think that we're writing for people that probably don't know how to do this. Yeah. So we have to explain every little piece of the, of, of the technique. Not everybody knows how to fry. Not everybody knows how to recognize, you know, a fresh apple. I mean, we read yeah. that. Or how to cut up an onion. Exactly. So you really have to start from the beginning. So eventually we decided to have books and recipes that go for a wide audience and then more specific books by chefs that can be used by people who already have experience and want to learn something mm -hmm. more. But the two books are completely different and the mm -hmm. kind of questions that we imagine in our minds from the readers mm -hmm. are completely different. Well, I, again, this brings up a topic for all of you, the timelessness of writing. I mean, the fact is, and I, I want to ask, start with Francis, this book, Beard on Food, was written a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It was four years of columns, and you read it like it was written Thursday. You know, as writers and editors, how much do you think about what is somebody going to... I mean, we're in a library, for goodness sakes. You know, we want to have words around that can be useful and helpful to us, not just in studying history, but in thinking now, in learning now. How much uh, does that play into your mind or to your work uh, it, it, with regards to the timelessness of what's being put on the paper? Well, the reason why I can't say anything right now is because I'm thinking. But the reason why I'm thinking so hard about it is because I'm, I'm considering the idea that, I mean, I'll be frank with you, like, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not writing for posterity. Okay. Right. That's okay. what I, I was just asking. I mean, I, I, mean I, right. when I, when I sit down to write something, I think, like, here's a story I want to tell. Here's a story that may be interesting. Here's a story that may hopefully be entertaining, be like a nice thing for someone to spend some time on and hopefully maybe maybe even inspire them to think something, maybe feel something. But I wouldn't dare to presume that here I am putting something down for the record. You know, and I feel, well, and so I don't even think of library, right? I don't think of book. I think, of, you know, I write for magazines and, and newspapers and like for the internet, like very <laughs> ephemeral sort of media. Yeah. And um, I don't know, maybe maybe, maybe I just don't have the ego to think this is going. This is timeless work. Um, that said, you know I do want to say also that it. I, I don't. I don't think of my. I don't think of the thing I want to do as being disposable, right? I want to think of it as being something that um, can connect to something larger, can connect to a tradition, or can connect to an emotional or an intellectual experience that someone might have, or, or a sensory experience someone might have at the table, on the plate. Um, 
Can you ask the question again? Well, I, you know, it, it makes me think of when David Camp was here and somebody said, you know, well, really, what do you think of your United States of Arugula? And he said, it ain't Proust. And then he thought for a moment and he said, but then neither was Proust. It, uh, timelessness. Well, also for me, it depends if I write for the internet, for the magazine and whatnot. I put much more thought about the timelessness of what I write when I write a book. Okay. And then it's when I'm like, okay, maybe I have to give a second thought because this could ha actually end up, end up in a library. And you never know. So your ego is more involved than his. Is what you're, uh, in books. In when books. I books. When I do my daily job, when I'm writing about, you know, stories about the U.S. for the magazine, of course I want to be relevant. Of course I want to, I want to be entertaining and engaging. But there's less pressure, definitely. Well, and Pete, it, it's called the newspaper of record. So, I mean, how does this... Uh, does this affect you at all? Do you? Yeah, I've actually never thought about it before. Um, um, <laughs> well, I'm glad you came today. Yeah, um, but I'm I've upset to, you. I'm glad I didn't have to go first. Um, I mean, you know, 99% like of what's published in magazines and newspapers doesn't deserve to last. You know, mm. it's, it's just mm. it's not meant to, and, it's, right. and, and, and it shouldn't. Uh, um, uh, I think, actually, probably the most lasting stuff that we that we publish in the in the dining section would be the recipes um, uh, because I you know, they go into a book they, they go into books but mm. they, they get clipped and I get letters yeah. from I got a letter from somebody a couple of weeks ago who wanted to know where she could find a brand of chocolate that was called for in a recipe that was published in the New York Times in 1968. <laughs> and she couldn't find the chocolate anymore, so she couldn't make the recipe. And I actually, I was so, um, just, just <laughs> amazed by this, that I spent some time trying to track this chocolate down. Um, well, wait a second, you've got a good group here. What was it called? Yeah. I mean, yeah. this is the group. It was called Eagle. Eagle? Mallet. Eagle, eagle what? There's another, oh. the three words. Mallard, eagle, Nine people in this audience sweet. have some Mallard, at home sweet. in the freezer. Right? <laughs> Mallard. Okay, so, so, all right, so Pete, well, Pete, wow. you should be aware that they're watching, reading, and remembering things like crazy. So maybe it's not 90%. Maybe it's a little <laughs> bit less than 90% is ephemera. But, but I, you know, the... In the newspaper, we publish a lot of facts, and the, we try to get the facts right. And right. the reason we try to get the facts right is because somebody's going to look them up right. 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, and that stuff should be there. What happened on this day in 2008? That stuff yeah. should be there. So it's, you know, it's lasting in that sense, but I don't think anyone's going to read our front page story on Spitzer's resignation as literature. But they, they'll read it to see like what was the, what was the mood in Albany on that day. Um, but you know the, the recipes are in a different sphere. They're, they're, a recipe is, is new every time you make it, um, and it comes to life every time you make it. All right. It's never the same twice. Uh, it's never the same twice. So in that way, the recipes are probably closer to literature. Mm -hmm. The experience of reading mm -hmm. proves mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. the book is different every time you open it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop and listen to that one. That's wonderful. That's really wonderful. I was with a group of people, and uh, one of the people involved was, we were visiting a region it was in Seattle, and this woman just never shut up. She didn't listen to anybody else. Most of what she said was like that news that it really wasn't worth remembering or hearing the first time. And at one point, she threw up her hands and she said, I love being a blogger. There's no editor. And we all thought to ourselves, could we have one now? <laughs> Will you say a word, please, each of you? And I guess, Judith, if you want to go first, uh, there's a question about bloggers and about blogging and about its impact on writing about food. Well, I think an awful lot of people are getting their information about food on these mm. blogs. I mean, they go home and want to cook a little broiled chicken, and they look it up on the internet. <laughs> they Google it, I guess. I don't know what they do. But it, it, I think it is, is having an effect on cookbook sales, the impact of cookbooks. It's quick, it's easy, uh, and what's distressing is that the, the, the author doesn't much matter. It's just a formula. It doesn't have the kind of information 
that makes you a really good cook as against just throwing it together. So I, th I think it's having some impact. And, and Pete, uh, I keep saying that, that the, a blog from the New York Times to me is usually made up of things that didn't make it into the New York Times. I mean, because it seems to me that everybody else blogging all over the country is just doing it so they can try to get into the New York Times. I mean, am I overstating it? Or I mean, how do you feel about blogs in general? I said that out loud, didn't I? I made him laugh. <laughs> Apparently, we struck a note, struck a chord, just a little tiny bit of a chord. I, I, wrote a, I wrote an essay a couple years ago about how much I hate food blogs. And <laughs> it, it was like, um, it, it was almost like the tuna story, except instead of the, the tuna industry, it was like every food blogger in America was, Attack. uh, was attacking me. Yeah. Um, so I, I am uh, loath to to, um, to <laughs> crucify myself again. <laughs> that being said, um, uh, uh, but you know, I, I don't know. It's, in some ways, I think that the New York Times blogs are strange because they're they're um, often they don't read like blogs to me because right. they're written by professional trained journalists and they can't get that training out of their system no matter how hard they try so mm -hmm. that you know the nature of a blog should be really quick and off the cuff and a lot of ours are, are little reported stories uh, um, so uh, you know in, in that sense I think that the, the, a lot of blogs are, are bloggier than our blogs I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll add that to my dictionary <laughs> Francis um, <clears throat> uh, you have to give me a second on this because I have to sort of like grab these things out of the air and, and put them together. But um, a friend of mine once said to me, uh, I think blogs are destroying the state of American letters. Um, and that's a really strong statement. Yeah. And uh, I, d I don't know that it's true, but I see where you're saying it. I, th I think the question that I want to ask of, um, of that you know, moment you had is, why does this person not want an editor? Right. What's behind that? Oh, I love it. I don't have an editor. Um, I was thinking. Well, right, right, and that and that's definitely a part of it, right? But like, you know, I feel like, um, again, I, I think to the, the the great work that um, that that, that uh, I feel has has come as a result, and, and not even in terms of product, but in process of my working with editors, uh, who I really appreciate and respect um, and admire. Uh, you know, it's like the editor, and when, when you look at the product, the editor is like MSG, right? You kind of don't know it's there, it makes it taste a little better. Uh, <laughs> it makes it taste more like itself, right? right. Which is really important, I think. Um, and, you know, and it also gives you a splitting headache and like yeah. a parched mouth. And like, you know, when I get really bad MSG, it's like, it feels like you can't breathe and your like, chest is constricting. Like, right, I know that one. Um, so that's really, like, I was like, oh, that's a perfect metaphor. Yeah. Um, and so is the, is the blogger happy about not having an editor because... They don't want it to taste better. And OK, we can get into another conversation about whether MSG is legitimate or not, but whatever. Um, or do they not want to have an editor because they don't want that headache piece of it? Yeah. And do they not want to get to that point where you have to push yourself and you have to experience a little bit of discomfort in order to learn? Right? Again, I, I keep thinking about learning and teaching, right? and how discomfort is the nature of learning. You don't learn anything when you're sitting back on a couch and on a sofa and you're like, oh, yeah, what's up? Like, you're not learning anything there. It's not invaluable. I mean, it's not a bad thing, but it's, you're not learning. Um, so, but on the other hand, there is also, I think, something to be said about this thing, this, this sort of thing that is a, an unfiltered, very immediate um, journal. When you talked about, you know, the Times being the paper of record, and does that sort of, like, does that impact the work that Pete or, or, or everyone at the Times does? Like, I don't know, because I think it's the paper record, but it's also, at the same time, it's a living document, right? There's a new one every day. Right. There's a new one every day. And I don't think the idea is, on March 13th, the New York Times that day is, bang, that's history. That's the record. But I think the idea is, when you look at it, when you pull back a little bit, and you look at the thing as a whole, it's a process, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Which is sort of like the whole Wikipedia thing. Is Wikipedia like a really, really a thing, or is it just a process? I'm going way far no, outside no, the no. question. But I, mean, I think there is something to be said about the idea of blogs as being unfiltered, unmediated um, experiences. But part of that is you understand they're not finished product. Blogs and writing, there's nothing like real in-person conversation. Let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs>
what I want to do to make sure that we have time before they lock the library is to invite you all back uh, so that these nice people can spend some time with you individually. The book is for sale. <laughs> the Friends of Write Up is there. Uh, Pete Mondavi Jr. has once again sent us a little something in bottles, chilled, to go with our farmer's market foods that are back there as well. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you very soon. Again, thank you, panel, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you.